Scott Mason is not your average conservationist. And the species he's out to save is not one you might expect. This is one of the quickest, fastest, catastrophic declines of any animal since the dodo. It's not the panda, the tiger or the polar bear, but vultures on the brink of extinction. Extinction, it's just it's such a, a, a profound word. It's, it means gone forever, forever. And that means, you know, you, you, if, when you look up in the sky, you, there's, there's no chance that you're going to see a vulture flying by. But in his fight to save the vultures, Scott has a secret weapon. He's the only man in the world who flies with vultures. And now he wants to take his efforts to new heights by attempting his most daring and spectacular conservation event ever. Stop, 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 stop. In his quest to protect these misunderstood animals. I'd hate to wake up and then not be any vultures. I can't imagine there not be any vultures. Nepal is perhaps best known for the mighty Himalayas, the highest mountain range in the world and the most extreme destination for any adventurer. Falconer Scott Mason has made this the home for his unique brand of conservation. If you ask anyone who's interested in birds, any ornithologist or any falconer, they'll tell you they've got an interest in conservation you have to have. Certainly, growing up as a falconer in the UK, um, being involved in falconry clubs and going to falconry shows and bird shows and whatever, you know, it's, it's always there inside you, that passion. Um, but it wasn't until I came here that I really felt that I could make a difference, do something really, really special. When Scott first arrived in Nepal in 2001, Asia's vulture population was already in trouble. Now the vultures are listed as critically endangered, just one step away from extinction. There's a lot of effort going into vulture conservation in Nepal, uh, in India, in Pakistan, by lots of different organisations, uh, the BCN, the RSPB, the World Wildlife Fund, the Peregrine Fund, all these big conservation bodies, but it's obviously not enough. We're still seeing a decline and we're still seeing less and less birds in the sky. You've got to ask yourself, well, you know, can we do more? Sometimes you've got to be a little bit creative when uh, you're dealing with conservation, particularly when you're, you're trying to help um, species that are difficult to empathise with, you know, and, and vultures aren't the prettiest animals. Everyone's image of a vulture is of it, with its head stuck in a carcass, you know, covered in blood, and um, people don't really care that they're dying out in their millions, and uh, you've got to do whatever you can, you know, and you know, doing something a little bit creative and a little bit inventive, sometimes that's what it takes. Scott realised that for people to be sympathetic, they would need to see vultures in an entirely different light. And it was when he first tried paragliding that he thought he might have a solution. By marrying his lifelong love of falconry with his newfound passion for paragliding, Parahawking was born. When Scott trained his rescued vultures, Kevin and Bob, to fly with him, he was able to give people the opportunity to experience vultures from a unique perspective. It wasn't long before parahawking attracted interest from the international press, giving Scott the platform to tell the world about the vulture's plight. If you can do something that you can create this amount of public awareness and try and channel that effort into, into a cause, then, you know, why not do it? It just seems the obvious, obvious link. Scott has devoted his life to rescuing and rehabilitating birds of prey. He has built a dedicated sanctuary to care for sick and injured birds at his home in Pokhara.
but the traditional falconry methods that Scott uses are sometimes misinterpreted, and he has recently received some very negative publicity. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article by a newspaper here basically saying that parahawking was illegal, uh, keeping birds was illegal, uh, parahawking was uh, the worst type of animal abuse and it should be banned and, and I should be stopped. It was an out and out attack on, on what we've been doing here and what we've tr been trying to do for conservation since, since we began in 2001. And we sort of dealt with it, but it, we knew it wasn't going to go away. And then today, uh, there's been a new article in the, in the paper saying that parahawking is going to be banned. Quoting a number of government officials and ministers saying that, you know, A, we're not licensed to keep birds. B, we're doing parahawking illegally uh, in the name of rehabilitation. And C, that the birds are going to be uh, confiscated. We put the birds away and we lock them up. Someone could come here and just uh, and just say, look, we're confiscating the birds, and there wouldn't really be a lot I could do about it, apart from kicking and screaming in front of the aviaries. The worst case scenario is that they ban parahawking for whatever reason, um, and I won't be able to raise money for, for vulture conservation through the parahawking. All of the, the international awareness that we bring to, for, for the plight of the vultures, that's all going to be stopped. Uh, the, you know, the consequences of it are, are quite serious. The timing couldn't have been worse. Scott was planning a major event to raise the profile of vulture conservation. His idea was to fly with vultures, Kevin and Bob, from Nepal's iconic fishtail mountain, way higher and further than he had ever attempted before. We're planning on going to a place called Korchon, which is about 3,200 metres. And it's the most ambitious and adventurous parahawking expedition we've ever done. Um, it's about a three-day trek and it involves getting the birds fit. We've been you know, preparing for this for, for about a year. Uh, the team at the moment standing at about 16 people. And the idea is that we, you know, we do this, uh, this ambitious parahawking flight um, in the name of the vultures to try and raise awareness and uh, raise the vultures profile. A ban now would jeopardise the whole project. But whatever his troubles, Scott always puts the welfare of the birds first. His priority now was to assess the damaged wings of a recently rescued black kite. The bird had most likely been kept as a pet because its wings had been clipped. This is animal cruelty, clipping a bird's wings so it can't fly. Without Scott's help, this kite may never fly again. He's hoping the wings can be repaired. It's a delicate operation, so lending a hand are his partner Anita and fellow adventurer Dave Metzgar. Okay, right, so we've got... One, two, three. We've got these three here we need to do. Maybe even that one. But those three. Scott's using an ancient falconry technique called imping, replacing the missing feathers with ones he's collected, matching and measuring each one, because in order to fly, the finished wing has to be exactly the right so shape. The new ones, does the old one fall out and then the new one replace it, or does the new one start to grow in underneath it and then the old one falls out next? To it? The new one pushes the old one out. So it's the same follicle? Yeah. yeah, it's the same follicle. With its wings successfully repaired, the kite stands a good chance of making a full recovery. But the rehabilitation process is not always that straightforward, and some birds in Scott's care need prolonged treatment. Clive, a wild eagle, has been at the sanctuary for almost 18 months. Clive was a male step eagle that came in with a broken wing and although he was a very strong bird, he, has a, he had a lot of spirit and he was a young bird, um, he still had a physical injury that was going to be quite complicated to, to fix. We suspect that he'd either been catapulted or he'd had a rock thrown at it or something That's because he'd, well. he'd probably made a bit of a dodgy decision and went to catch somebody's chicken. 
got a bit hungry one day, took a bit of a risk, and it backfired. It was because of Clive's courageous attitude that Scott felt a special connection with him from day one. I think I could uh, relate to Clive in, in the sense that we shared the same kind of gutsy spirit and, um, and I didn't want to let him down. So I, I said there and then that I was going to do my best to help him and get him through it. The whole purpose of this is to try and tame him and train him so I can see if he can, see if he can fly. You can't just throw them in the air and then expect them to survive. It's a tough world out there, and if they can't cut the mustard, then they'll end up dying of starvation. So it's important that when we do release birds that we make sure that they have the best possible chance of survival. And that, unfortunately, means that you've got to put them through the stresses of training them. Um, but, you know, imagine you're a marathon runner. You've got to go through those stresses and you know, trials and tribulations of training, and it hurts, you know, and it's, it's, unfortunately it's going to be the same for him for a while, but we've got to make sure that he can fly well enough that he can catch his own food and survive. Scott is confident that Clive will eventually be fit enough to be released. But some birds, like Egyptian vultures Kevin and Bob, can never leave the sanctuary, because they wouldn't survive in the wild. Through parahawking, Scott ensures that they never miss out on the freedom that wild birds enjoy. We fly our birds every single day. Our birds are very fit, probably as fit, or maybe even more so than their wild cousins. and. Um, Actually, they probably fly for longer periods of time during the day than wild birds. There is always an element of risk when you're flying the birds completely free in their own natural environment. Remember, they're, they're absolutely free. So they can make their own decisions, uh, and they quite often do. Um, they certainly let me know when they've had enough. And very rarely, you know, they'll, they'll just bail out and go home. They know where they live. It's very easy to anthropomorphise birds of prey. Are they happy? Do they, do they fly for fun? What we do know is that when we're fit, we're happy, we have a sense of well-being. And, uh, and I'm sure that when the birds are flying around, they're fit and they're healthy and uh, they're quite possibly happy. Back on the ground, the false allegations of animal cruelty raised in the recent newspaper articles were having repercussions. I woke up feeling quite positive this morning, but then, um, then I was told that I'm actually banned from flying. It's all a bit bizarre. So I get accused of animal abuse. Um, for keeping training, exercising the birds, keeping them fit and healthy. I get closed down by whoever and um, I can't exercise and fly the birds. That's animal abuse, isn't it? So all he wants to do is fly. Scott was concerned that this could lead to an all-out ban on parahawking, affecting his conservation efforts and the welfare of his birds. It's just escalating to the point where it's almost unbearable. It's, 
you, you, you get to a point where something's so unbearable and it makes you so unhappy that you, you've just got to think, well, what is the point in doing all this? But then you come in here and you sit with the eagle and then you think, well, this is the point because, you know, you think my life's bad. He spent the last year in here recovering from a broken wing because someone catapulted him. And he's, all he really wants to do is just get up and fly and go back to the wild and that's the aim, he's really... So I'll stick it out for, for him if anything else. With the ban in force and the monsoon season approaching, Scott was running out of time to prepare for his highest ever parahawking flight. But knowing there was a potential of an outright ban on parahawking, cancelling the expedition could be the least of his problems. It's a worry of mine every single day. I wake up in the morning and I think, are we going to be able to continue with parahawking? Some of the obstacles that are being put in our way are just making it more and more difficult. And it seems such a shame that something that can do such good will end up being banned for various different reasons and, and we'll have to stop. But we're riding the storm and hopefully we can continue with parahawking and continue with the project and continue to raise awareness for vulture conservation. If parahawking was stopped, then um, we'd have to just try and find something else. Um, we, we got this far, so we're gonna carry on. But raising awareness alone won't save the vultures. When the decline of a species is faster than that of the dodo, the situation has to be tackled on the front line. He decided to visit the south of Nepal, where a project has been set up to tackle the heart of the problem. The unprecedented decline of Asia's vultures can be attributed to just one factor, cows. More specifically, the place the cow occupies in Hindu culture. In most of the world, cows are slaughtered long before they get old and frail, and the carcasses are used for meat. But in Hindu culture, the cow is sacred. They are kept for as long as possible with the help of modern veterinary drugs, and when they eventually die of old age, their bodies are not butchered, but left for vultures to dispose of. The most popular drug is diclofenac, an anti-inflammatory which stays in the cow's body long after it's dead and is subsequently ingested by vultures, with fatal consequences. In Chitwan, D.B. Chowdhury has made it his personal mission to address the problem, and he's gone to extreme measures, buying up all the stocks of diclofenac in the area. This is the majority of it? Or what? So not, not only this much, we have uh, three times bigger amount of okay. uh, drugs is at my home. Yeah, I mean this is the this is the drug this here yeah. that's causing all of the problem. Yeah. 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 So once uh, vultures they eat this uh, diclofenac used cattle's meat yeah. and they die within 24 hours. DB has also set up the world's first community managed vulture restaurant, where diclofenac free meat is on the menu. So cows are obviously a sacred animal. Yes, uh, they are sacred animals. We are not allowed to kill. Yeah. And this animal is naturally dead because okay. of its old age. Yeah. So the next uh, stage is that we're going to move the uh, animal. Yeah, this animal to the feeding center. Okay. We will turn the skin, then we'll release the uh, dead body for the vultures. Okay. The community buy retired cattle from farmers and care for them until they die. In return, the hide is sold and the money goes back to the local people. The project has been running since 2006 and DB has seen a significant rise in local vulture numbers. At the beginning of this project, we started counting uh, and then in our record there was only uh, 72 at a time and after two and a half years we found uh, 270 at a time. Testing uh, number is also increasing, so uh, no, uh, nest number is also more than doubled now. 
With a threefold increase in the number of critically endangered white backed and slender billed vultures, Nepali vulture restaurants, or vulture safe zones as they are known, are proving to be a real success. The one in Chitwan is actually set up uh, as a tourist attraction. And it provides a real opportunity for people to get up close and personal with these birds of prey, birds that um, they simply wouldn't be able to see in the wild. Vultures have been nature's cleaners for thousands of years. They play a vital role in our ecosystem. Millions and millions of tons of animal carcasses are disposed of every year across Asia. And if you don't have the, the, the vultures to, to clean them up, then uh, it poses a real risk to human health and safety. We can turn these situations around, you know, with the right amount of effort, the right amount of funding. We've done it before in the States, in the, in the UK with DDT. We have birds on the brink of extinction, the peregrine, the bald eagle, and, you know, we turn these problems around, and there's no reason why it can't be done here. It takes some creativity you know, in, in terms of something like parahawking, to really, you know, bring that message home. Getting people to relate to the birds that they're trying to save. Getting people to, to understand that vultures are actually nice animals and they're useful in our ecosystem. Um, they've got an identity, they've got characters and personalities, you know, and these, these are animals that really, really need saving. Back home in Pokhara, with his flying ban still in force, Scott decided to concentrate all his efforts on getting Clive the eagle ready to be released. But rehabilitating a wild eagle is rarely simple. He's pulled it out and he's going mental. I'm gonna need the, uh, the hood. One of the main problems with dealing with uh, injured eagles with all birds of prey, but particularly eagles, is they are so wild. And they really don't like being in captivity. And they definitely don't like being tied down. Well, his list is not tied up. We tried every possible solution to, to help him. We tried to leave him loose in the aviary. That didn't go too well because once his wing was out of the cast, he was able to move it around, but then he would continue to fly up against the, the wire. And on a number of occasions, he reopened oh the wound. God. So Scott had been forced to tether him, but Clive had struggled so much that he had wrenched the heavy iron perch out of the ground and in the process injured his leg. He can't even stand up properly on that leg now. Right, I think we've got a bit of a problem here. He's going to end up hurting himself. He can't even stand on it. He can't put any weight on it. Oh. This is the... Uh problems you get when you're rehabbing wild eagles because they just don't want to be in captivity. They don't want to be tied down. They don't know why you're trying to help them, so they're not going to submit to your behaviour. They just want to get away. They want to get away and um, you know you can't just release them back into the wild when they're not fit and healthy. And the more stress we put him under, the more problems he's having. The injury to the leg wasn't too serious, but would need some treatment. 
So Scott moved Clive to a more central aviary where he could keep him under closer observation to make sure the leg healed properly. Oh, that's massively swollen. You just can't have wild eagles tethered. Look at that. Was that as bad as that before? It was not swollen. It's swollen now. Yeah. How can I release this bird like this? The hood keeps them calm. It basically uh, prevents any distractions. So whatever they can't see, they're not really affected by. He knows that there's stuff going on around him, but he can't actually see what's going on. So um, even, even though he looks a little bit stressed, he's a lot calmer than he would be if he didn't have the hood on. And once we leave here and it's nice and quiet, then uh, he'll, be, he'll be a lot calmer. Just gonna put some of this powder on his leg. Just, just, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to touch the other one because the other one's actually fine. So let's leave him. The plan had been to ensure Clive was fit enough to chase and catch his own prey, something that would have taken weeks of training and exercise. But it was becoming clear that the fitness campaign could do more harm than good. Ultimately, the best thing really is to get him fat and get him as healthy as we can and just release him back into the wild. The arrival of the first storm meant the flying season would soon be over for at least four months. But for Scott, there was a glimmer of hope. He discovered that his flying ban was only for 10 days. A week had already passed, meaning the flying ban had almost expired. The Himalayan expedition was back on. We're going to go on a two-day trek and take the birds with us, Bob and Kevin. Um, we've been talking about it for a while, but um, given that we've had a few problems over the last couple of weeks, you know, the, with the authorities and the ban and everything, we figure that now is probably the right time, right time to do it. Um, if you look behind us there, you can see uh, you've got Machpachari, the peak. Now, just below that is a, is a peak or an area called Korchon, and uh, we're going to hike up there. It's going to be a two-day hike and we're going to take off from the top. It's about 3,200 metres, and we're going to try and make it all the way back. One of the, most important things is, uh... the plan was to use two tandem gliders, one to watch over each bird. Scott would fly one glider, and the second would be flown by experienced pilot Dave Metzgar. Ever since I was 13, I've been free flying, flying hang gliders and paragliders uh, for my primary hobby. Um, and. It's what I truly love to do. I was inspired to fly as a child by both my uh, father and by um, my birds and just the idea of flight. Always make sure that Kevin's away from the glider. Uh, you've got a lot of distance between 
uh, yourself and him, and then you can call him. So you blow the whistle okay. two times. We had to go through some uh, training for Dave. Uh, he'd flown with the birds a couple of times before when he came out to Nepal last year. So he, uh, he knew uh, the, the, how the concept worked and some of the, the methods that we use. But this time he was going to be flying as a, a tandem pilot with his own passenger. So it was slightly different to just flying solo. And especially since we were taking on the, the biggest and the highest and the most adventurous parahawking expedition there'd ever been, um, we wanted to make sure that he had all of the knowledge. Parahawking flights can be uh, a little bit complex at times. When we're flying, quite often we're flying with a number of other pilots in the sky. Um, the conditions are very changeable. Um, so you've got to make sure that you've got full control of the glider and full awareness of, of the situation. Quite often the birds are around the glider, quite close to the lines. So it's, uh, it's imperative that it's, you, can, you understand the bird's behaviour in flight and how to react and control the glider to avoid any situations such as the birds getting caught in the lines or the paraglider, which is very rare, but can happen if you don't quite understand what to do. For Dave, this was an opportunity he couldn't miss. It was something that I think all pilots, or at least many pilots, dream of, of doing, actually flying actively with birds and interacting with them to find lifting air and, and to travel in the air but uh, it was something that I had never imagined was possible or that anyone might actually be doing. Dave was amazing. He had to take the controls and take the rain and do everything that he needed to do for the Quachon trip. And, um, and he passed the test with flying colours. Everything was coming together for the expedition, but there was one thing still troubling Scott. Clive, the eagle. We were at a stage where he was so stressed all the time and that was manifesting itself in various different injuries and situations that he, he was unlikely to even survive in captivity. And we'd gone through so much over the last year and a half that I just simply couldn't allow that to happen. Once he was sure Clive's injuries had healed, Scott made the difficult decision to set him free and hope for the best. Given his overall attitude, over the last year and a half, and his gutsy spirit. I thought if any bird could make it, he, he could. But I still wasn't 100% comfortable with the situation. And I questioned that decision every second up until the point I opened the box. At this moment, it's do or die, really. Am I letting this bird go into an uncertain future? Just praying that he would just fly off into the distance. And um, I just took my hands away. And it felt like a lifetime, but what was actually only a, a fraction of a second, he just took off. When I watched him fly, when I watched him fly off, there was a, a real rush of emotions. And not because I'd made the right decision for me, because I'd made the right decision for him. It was him that got his own way eventually. After a year and a half of being in captivity, all he wanted to do was just be in the wild. This just real desire, this natural kind of burning urge to just get out there and do what he does naturally. And when I finally see him take the turn and get into the lift and start climbing out, that was the real kind of moment. And yes, he's, you know, he's kind of hooked into a thermal and 
and he's only going one way now and he's going up and in a couple of moments he climbed about 2,000 feet and just disappeared towards the mountains. The day of the expedition finally arrived. Everything was in place. Uh, the porters were ready, the vehicles were booked, the birds were ready at the right weight, fit and healthy. Uh, the team were up for it and um, the weather was just diabolical. But it was too late, we decided. We decided we were gonna go and that was it, we, we were off. Korchon was uh, something that we had planned on doing for a few years, but I've been training birds for a long time and I'm, I'm very cautious about pushing birds to do things that, that they might not be able to do physically. I'm aware of the, our birds' limitations, and so you know I, I always wanted to make sure that when we do it, we, the birds were going to be fit enough to complete the journey. Quite exciting. Talking about doing something like this for a few years. Well, not that great, but you know. What else has gone right for us so far? <laughs> Team of 12 porters. How many of us going up? Five. Five of us. 12 porters. Four gliders. Three tandems. All the bird stuff, bow perches, cameras. Quite a lot. A team of porters carried all the flying, cooking and camping equipment, so Scott and his team could concentrate on the important job of looking after the birds. That was one of concerns was carrying the birds all the way to the top, knowing that we'd only carried the birds for short periods of time throughout their life. Um, you know, this was quite a big expectation. On the first leg of the climb, the weather was very hot and incredibly humid, a sure sign that there would be heavy cloud higher up the mountain. If it's like this tomorrow, we're not going to fly. But we've heard that the humidity might be dropping, which will be good because uh, they can't see a thing. So that's promising, but we, you know, we just have to wait and see. We have to get up there and do what we can. Can't change the weather. You've got to remember that we were carrying two Egyptian vultures up this mountain. Uh, these are birds that, since the start of their life, they've been trained to fly with the paragliders every day. Every single day they go out and fly. So for them to sit on the fist for eight hours, ten hours a day walking was incredible. It's quite tiring for the birds, even though you think, well, they're getting carried, you know, it's, it's an easy ride. It's not really. They're using up a lot of energy and balancing and they're in an unnatural environment but it's testament to their kind of phlegmatic characters. You know, they're happy to be in, in our environment, um, but the payoff is eventually we're gonna be in their environment. And I think Egyptian vultures, certainly Kevin and Bob, were smart enough to realize that there's a, a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel.
At the end of the first day, with six of the 10 miles behind them, the team reached the first camp. Uh, we're uh, halfway up Korchon. Uh, we just arrived. We've been trekking for a few hours. Um, we've climbed, climbed about 3,000 feet today. Um, as you can see, the weather's not looking too inspiring, which is sort of typical of some of the, uh, the events that have happened over the last, the last few weeks, really. The plan is now to uh, stay here tonight and then trek up another 1,000 metres to the second uh, camping spot. We'll stay there overnight and then hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get some blue sky early in the morning and we'll take off and fly. Um, somewhere behind these clouds, there's a beautiful view of the mountains. <laughs> so we're, you might just have to take my word for that. Um, but the birds are here, we're here, and, um, and you know, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll get to fly home. On the morning of the second day, there were signs that the humidity was dropping and the weather might be improving. That was a tough day because uh, there was some really heavy climbs and, and it was actually more like climbing than walking. You know, there was a, there was a quite a steep ascent. Um, of about an hour and a half. When you're carrying birds, you know, it's really, really tough. This is hard. What temperature would you say it was? Yeah. How much is it? We're walking up here, I know that much. With a three pound vulture. Two. And then we all got a little bit sick because we decided to tuck into the porter's nettle soup, which probably wasn't the best idea, but it seemed a good idea at the time. And uh, we all came down with, you know, what we call deli belly. And uh, that made it a little bit of a struggle. And to make matters worse, the improvement in the weather turned out to be short lived. The blue skies they had hoped for when they cleared the cloud forest were nowhere to be seen. We were we engulfed in cloud. We couldn't see uh, 10 yards in front of our face. Because we couldn't see where we were going, it just seemed to go on forever. It was literally an uphill struggle to keep the motivation going. That was one of the hardest things because we were walking up to a takeoff site that, that actually we were probably going to end up walking down from and um, the hardest thing was just staying motivated. It's flat. This is it. Looks like a takeoff. This is it, it's got to be it, isn't it? We're uh, at Korchon, 3,162 metres. So we've been trekking for the last couple of days. It's a bit cold and it's just started to rain and we're surrounded by cloud. But <laughs> we're hoping tomorrow is going to be nice and clear and the plan is to get off early 
and, uh, and fly down and do some filming and get some amazing footage. The spirit was quite high in the camp, but we all still had the deli belly. And, uh, and it was funny because uh, halfway through the night I had to get up and I undipped the tent and it was about four o'clock in the morning and there was Machapachari just right there. It was the most amazing feeling because we knew then, you know, we were going to be able to fly down and get the birds down. It was incredible. We had one shot at this, you know, we had a one clear morning. There wasn't an option to stay over another night. Those last minute kind of preparations leading up to the takeoff was just the, the sort of kind of deathly silence of everyone concentrating. There were so many things that could have gone wrong on this expedition. It, it was just a very tense, stressful moment. There's always an element of risk when you're taking off on a paraglider and uh, wind is sometimes your friend and no wind is definitely your enemy. And on this occasion, there was no wind. There was not a breath of wind. The mountain itself had a nice grassy launch area uh, with a cliff at the end. And you basically have to run until you hit the cliff and then you either fall or fly. If there had been some kind of accident on the takeoff, we, we would have actually been all alone. Uh, it would have been a long while before we, there would have been any kind of rescue or, or help coming our way. Just going to wait for a decent wind. Seems pretty straight. From the standpoint of excitement, uh, the launch was very exciting. Stop, 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 stop! And that was more of a amusement park sort of moment where you know it's going to work. It just seems a little sketchy for a moment or two. Oh, oh man. If you've never been on a paragliding uh, flight before, that sensation, that feeling of running off the hill and, and, uh, and the ground falling away beneath you and, and everything else being below you, it's quite an, a sort of an extraordinary and a very unnatural feeling. Um, I've been flying for 10 years and um, this brought back those initial sort of feelings of, you know, that excitement and, you know, that real thrill of, of flying and, you know, that real buzz of being in the air. to look down and see a 3,000 metre kind of void below you. We were just in the stratosphere. It was the highest I'd ever been on a paraglider. And to have the birds flying with us was just uh, an incredible sensation.
What was interesting was the sound of the glider flying at that altitude. There wasn't any wind, so it was all you could hear was the glider just cutting through the sky. It was just an amazing sensation. I'd be a fool if I thought that one single flight down from Kuo Chong was going to save millions and millions of vultures. There's still a huge problem, they're still dying out in their millions, and it's going to take a number of different things, and this is just one small effort to, to try and raise the bar a little bit. I think Nepal should be really proud of its achievements in vulture conservation. It's certainly leading the way with some of the projects and the successes that it's got. Um, but the fact is that we have lost about 40 million birds across Asia in the last 15 years. And if you think about um, endangered animals, you know, you probably think about the panda or the tiger or the orangutan, all close to extinction. but. In the race towards extinction, the vultures are actually going to get there first. So if we don't do something about it now, um, we're going to lose a very important species, and, and I don't think we can allow that to happen in our lifetime. <laughs>